Welcome to our Composecast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well over here. You were coming in on this side crystal clear but i'm i don't i think it's not because you're wired but i th- i think you got a what looks like a new camera over there is that right all right we we can dive into that first there's a there's a mess of wires here we can dive into if if really we need something to dive into but um <laughs> no you you had asked me before if i had these uh nicely curated and and managed and unfortunately i i, I do not um they're they're all just living right next to to my my little mini PC here, um, just a, a mess of wires, but it's 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 needed because I've been I've been rearranging them the past couple of days trying to get this to work. So I just got a a Canon M3, and that is a mirrorless camera, uh, and it it looks like you know it looks like a little little, little professional camera kind of thing, you know. Um, so it's it's really cool to have. I, I've been I've been looking around for one uh, that has a couple different requirements, um, and and this one just seemed to to fit the bill. So I picked it up. Uh, I picked up a lens that is specifically for like uh, portraits and uh, making making a, a subject stand out uh, really well. Uh, so it it looks really good for. Uh, close you know one one subject kind of interview podcast like so I was, I was really happy to get that um, now the thing about the the m3 is that it does not have a clean hdmi out right and and i'd initially just foregone any camera that that didn't have a clean hdmi out because obviously i need that to stream Right. You don't want to have like the overlays and the focus box that's tracking, you know, the right. autofocus and all that. You don't you don't want those while you're streaming. There's no real way to get around them unless you were like like they're on the edges and you crop them out. But at that point, you're lowering the resolution. You'd have to readjust and re-expand. And I couldn't use it for webcam for like Zoom and anything else. So I was like, you know what? I just want something that works. So I originally ruled this out. But. Uh, there is a community out there that specializes in hacking cameras. Go figure. Um, I, I don't know if it's check disc, but you know, CHDK, I, I didn't even look what that stood for, but uh, CHDK is a piece of, uh, I guess, firmware uh, yeah. that you can use to modify settings on your camera that otherwise are not modifiable. Um, so the, the, the Canon M3, which by the way, is a camera that came out in 2015, uh, they have a Canon 6, which is its successor, which does have... No, I'm sorry, that, that has the same limitations. Uh, and then the M6 Mark II, which just came out like last year, like in the middle of the pandemic, uh, they introduced the ability to have clean HDMI out. Now that camera, just the body, not even the lens itself is like $800, $850, right? So it's it's an expensive little boy there. Uh, whereas this M3, I was able to pick it up at under 250. I think it was like 237 or something yeah. like that. And then the lens is actually surprisingly expensive. I picked it up. I I'm think sure. it was j- just under 200. Um, so I'm I'm coming in uh, under 450 on this this entire rig here. That includes also getting two peripherals, which is the uh, HDMI cable and the battery which is actually an ac adapter kind of thing so it can just nice. yeah. keep going and going and going so those requirements all having been met i had to hack my way to to get the clean hdmi out and and this this check this functionality adds that and introduces that and i'm sitting here trying to trying to because what i had to do is i had to write to an sd card and uh, make it bootable and then put it into the camera and boot it up uh, and then it would recognize it as a, a boot, whatever. Um, yeah. So I was gonna say, did that just pick up as a firmware? Did the basically did you load essentially bytecode into this SD card, put it in the camera, and the camera's just like, hey, I recognize this format. I'm gonna take it, flash myself, and then unlock. Is it essentially an unlock? Is that well, what? Well, there's is? there's one more step. You're you're adding the firmware in there, yes, but there is a header that you have to put into the MBR or the uh, the partition disk, right? So 
the the header that you have to put in there is just the string boot disk right but it has to be present at a certain hex location on the device it's like so did you have to crack out like a hex editor to do this i could have i could have i absolutely could have um i was able to simply use dd uh to just use it as a raw disk device and, and write to it but i didn't know that at first i thought i was trying to figure out i was like i i knew it was something stupid simple like that like how how do i write these these commands here and there were several gui programs developed like eight years ago or whatever to, to do that. Some of them ran on Linux, some of them ran on Windows. And I got to the point where I was spinning up a Windows VM trying to expose the, the drive as a removable drive using VirtualBox. And I was like, I just, this, this is dumb, right? Because I read like half of the documentation. Of course. All right. If I had right. gone down to the second half of the documentation, it would say just use DD, and I would have been home oh, scot free. <laughs> so I've been using that for the better part of a decade. But no, no, I had to make it difficult on myself and not read the documentation and not see that as I linked here, there is a Linux method, and it is simply to DD several blocks um, with with the string boot disk. Uh, once once I got that, I just popped the SD card in. And uh, every time I do, it it boots up in it. Does that flash the firmware on the device, or do you have to boot to that? Uh, as does that SD card SD card stay in there permanently? So there are several different models where it does flash directly to the device. Uh, this model just uses the SD card boot okay. method. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So every time that SD card is in there, it will make that available. That that those firmware hacks available to me and also saves it. So like it, I, I don't have to do it every single time I reboot the camera. Okay. Yeah. 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 So there, that is, that is up and, and running there. And uh, I was able to get that, that in, uh, and boot it up and see the little thing and access the special menu and change the special features. And yeah, you, know, you can see me coming through a lot of cut actually. So this is, this is fun. You can actually hear and, and you'll be able to see this. But like, uh, oh yeah, yeah. I saw the uh, settings right there that showed yeah. up. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You, yep. you can see these. These are the custom settings um, <laughs> going through there. Uh, those all turn off. Yeah. So you're booting from ah. this SD card, uh, and now yes. you have a what? So it just goes mini HDMI out to your to a capture card. To a capture card, correct. So this is basically then, your str a streaming setup then. Can, you couldn't yes. save pictures to that disk while you're booted from it, could you? Yes, I could. Oh, okay. How about that? All right. Yep. Yeah, so I can I can save whatever I need to. Um, the the only other thing I had to work around, which was almost a deal breaker here, and I was, I was frustrated with it, is that I use up all of the USB <laughs> ports on my computer. Actually, all the ports, period. I don't think that there's one, yeah. <laughs> one port that's... Maybe the headphone jack. I don't think I use that right now, but I, 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 I do. I have my headphones right, right down there, so I, I, I could if I needed to. But the, the thing was the capture card, the fourteen dollar one from Amazon. That capture card is fat, and if you put it on a reg in into a regular USB drive, it overlaps the neighboring USB yeah. drive. No matter if it's horizontal or vertically aligned, it will overlap it. So I'm trying to figure out, I need that USB hub, right? I, I need that port. So how do I, how do I get this to work? And I tried a, a USB extender, um, which I just happened to have on hand, which didn't work USB A to USB A. And then some, for some reason I had a USB C to USB A. And that worked. Sure enough, yeah. That that carried whatever signal it needed to, and it looks fine now. But I was for a second there, I was like, "You've got to be kidding me!" Yeah, right, right. I was about to get out like a little something to shave it down and try to. <laughs> what is it? Just plastic, right, on the outside, almost. Oh, I, th I think it's actually on the card. Metal, aluminum, kind of. But it block. Either way, it blocks both ports, though, right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So From, with this extender, it just fits into a regular USB slot. Yep. Comes out a, a little, little like maybe six inch cable and, and plugs into the USB A adapter. So that, that works perfectly for me. That's awesome. Well, you look, you're coming through great. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was really happy to, to do this. I know the last integration discussion uh, that I had that recorded was with my laptop camera. 
And I was like, yeah. that was woefully inadequate. Yeah, yeah. And something needs to be done. So this is that something. Which is all an awesome something, I'd say. Yeah, the, the other thing I, th- I think I'd like to use this is is uh, going out. I, I do love when I'm out in like the woods or whatever, to, when I'm when I'm walking around there to be able to take uh, pictures. And um, yeah, I've just been using my my phone. Right. And I'm like this. I can do some much really better. Cool with. Yeah. 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 Well, that's awesome. And the autofocus is pretty sweet, too. So there's a lot. Even even the the settings on this camera, like uh, right now, I have it in a a specific portrait mode, uh, and that gives me a whole bunch of here. I can actually show you just because, why not, right? But like, is this coming through forward on yours? Because I think Jitsi flips it. Okay, so Jitsi flips it around for me. So so not only am I manipulating the buttons on the back of the camera right now, but I'm seeing it reversed i'm seeing it flipped mirrored for me so this is like okay this is difficult but uh i can tell you just because i've been playing around with it this is this sets the picture style and this is the portrait oops this is the portrait mode yeah and then i have all these settings to mess with so the sharpness the contrast the saturation the, the color tone so these i've been i've been playing with trying to get softer more vibrant colors and uh, more more natural everything um in, in addition to all of the uh all the other things Oops. yeah in a, in addition to to everything that's exposed with uh this menu so all of that which is yeah also now you're fun. now it's just uh over you basically so all i see is that one screen now well so all of that all of those settings would be on this view like around the outside, yeah. If I didn't, if I didn't hide them, which, okay. which I, I I do hide them. So it was fun to be able to go in and and, and change all those things. You know, the f stop, changing the ISO, changing the um, uh, um, shutter speed. Um, actually, what I really enjoyed is I got, I believe it was my lens, um, from a company called MPB forget what that stands for but mpb anyways what they they included in their packaging was a little diagram of like all of the terminology and and the the settings the configurable yeah. settings like um iso and aperture and depth of field and all that um it called they 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 just have it as demystifying the jargon right here but i love the way they they introduce it and and this should be a good segue but they they were very tactful on how they introduced this. I, I love it. They start with, time for a refresh. It's likely you're already aware of these terms, right? And I'm looking at that, well, no, I'm not, but uh, go on. <laughs> but but for someone who's coming at this and saying, you know, I, I'm I'm the expert. I know all, all about this stuff. It, it was still, you know functional as a really handy reference to have i mean they, they have it set up really well nice little triangle diagram and, and i'm sure this isn't anything new um but just kind of grabbing this all in into one place and i've i've stumbled across this most of the times and and talked with uh this with other people uh who i know who are photographers about these concepts uh, but just having it laid out really here is is, is really nice it looks like you've got a nice diagram for everything there. They really did a good job yeah. here, and and they really came at it with a with a humble approach, um, and it it made me a lot more receptive to this than I think it would have otherwise. Definitely. So I I gotta really applaud their their uh, approach in that situation. Definitely, well that's awesome. Yeah, so I'm ex- I, I think I mentioned it earlier. I'm excited to see what uh, comes from this uh, in terms of integration discussions and just kind of content i know you're already looking way better than i am over there on the podcast but uh up in your game is what i'd say yeah yeah I try, I'm, I'm trying i'm trying for sure that's awesome i have one other intro item we can roll with it we can skip it i found it uh kind of interesting it was on the uh <laughs> technical debt a concept we kind of talk on how uh, once every uh well, i'd say once every other podcast and this one is uh engineers waste one day a week on technical debt i believe it i'm just going to come out and say it i believe it there was 
I don't know if I would call it a study. I don't even know what I'd call it. A survey, a survey that came out and they, it was this company called step size that went around to 200 mid sized and startup organizations, uh, basically, basically asking questions about, you know, how much time do you spend doing maintenance? How much time do you spend doing stuff that otherwise is not developing the product or feature? And sure enough, it was uh, six hours a week, which they kind of equated to one day, which I guess if you round that somehow you get to eight. But that's okay. <laughs> maybe maybe if you factor in meetings, yeah, and 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 lunch yeah. and un unplanned interruptions from managers trying to figure out, you know, if you submitted your TPS reports, and yes, yeah, six hours is about a day. <laughs> um, but I found the most interesting was where they said the impacts of tech debt on their company was, um, and. The one that came out on top was server side controllers and logic at a whopping sixty one percent. And when you think about tech, uh, and when you think about this, it makes you wonder why wasn't it designed right in the first place, right? And I have to come back and look at how Command Center was kind of developed. We went the React approach first, and I would call it tech debt the way it was. I, I don't know if I'd call it tech debt, but it was a design flaw from the beginning. Because we didn't have everything we needed, all the specs weren't there, and I know we talked about this last week, but now we have out that uh, concierge feature on our admin side, not not ready to be exposed to the public yet, but um, basically we have everything we need to sign up a new customer right there in front of us, and you know before it was React components and this and that, and by the end it was kind of tech debt because it was about it was basically I had to refamiliarize myself with the code base before I could write any new code or any new features for the code base. So going in here to the second, third, and fourth, uh, the browser application or website was about 40% the impact of uh, tech debt. And then the infrastructure, well, it came in at only 32%. Uh, and then data models and ORM, which kind of stayed the same, which does make sense. It as long as you have all the data there, it, it kind of falls into spending time on logic, I guess. I don't know. I don't know how that one works. So I think I would be interested in splitting it up a different way. So here here they split it up of what is the impact of tech debt by component, if you would. They split sure. it up by server-side logic or front-end or infrastructure or database, which... To be fair, is how you split up a lot of apps. That's how components work, right? But I would be interested in types of issues. For instance, uh, bug fixes, um, automation opportunities, if you will. So like yeah. like manual yeah. toil, I, I think is the word that that we've used. You know, toil before if if. If you eliminate toil, you know, can you consider that tech debt? You know, and um, I know in our DevOps discussion, we said, how do you track the te tech debt, right? And a, a great place to start is what is in your maintenance, right? And then what is in your bug fixes? And then what is in your emergency, right? So I would be more interested to see how you describe tech debt. Because, I mean, we this morning we ran into tech debt. Or well, not this morning, but like before we before the show, yeah, recorded the podcast, we ran into tech debt, which is you know a, a bug. We ran into a bug that I'm going to have to fix, and that is not development on a new feature, right? Not not working towards their key goals. Would you describe it as maintenance? Would you? Because I, I would call them different. I would call them a bit different. Would, uh, from from a bug fix, yes. uh, tech debt from maintenance work. Well, so what's what's tech debt then? Something that has to be redesigned? E correct. Right. Okay. Something that is causing toil, essentially. So one one uh, model that I, I keep in my head, one example I keep in my head, is the way some of what I have to do in my day job, uh, how that works. So there is... There's a patching process wherein we have to generate an inventory uh, before we can run our automation. 
And sure. there is already automation around it, and the process does work. But that process isn't automated, and that process requires human toil to go through over and over again. Sure. So I would I would constitute that as tech, tech debt because there's a way to improve that, right? But that's I mean that's that's process automation. So do you call that I'm working towards process automation or I'm automating toil? Like I mean is is there a difference and is that tech debt or is that maintenance? Like that's I would say I would say if you're not developing any new processes. Right. Because a, a new process will get you places. For instance, right. we're developing a new way to run health reports and compositional roles and backups on instances, right? That is a new feature. That is a new feature. And if you think about how we have our cam board split up into swim lanes, right? We got new features at the very bottom, right? Lowest priorities. Right above that, we have maintenance, which is routine stuff that we do over and over and over again. And a lot of that is is stuff that we just haven't automated yet or stuff that, you know, like recording this podcast is just something we do on a, on a periodic schedule, right? Uh, then, then we have uh, incidents, which are bug fixes, right? And then we have emergency, which is if, if production is broken for some reason. And I would say that tech debt is not a emergency because an Mm -hmm. emergency is is like a putting out fires or whatever and that's just going to be in any kind of um you you're gonna you're gonna be faced with fires so putting out the fires is although the fires are typically caused by tech debt right the remediation there is probably going to be roll it back or or fix the environment issue It ends up being a Band-Aid, something quick to get it back to a stable state. And usually at that point, then, you can implement a bug fix uh, because, you know, there there was an incident. You can say, all right, let's catch that incident if it ever crops up again. And so then that becomes a bug fix, and that becomes tech debt because that's something you didn't account for initially when the application was architected, whether it's server-side or browser or infrastructure or data models. Like I, it, either way, it's it's going to be a bug fix, and that's how it's going to manifest in your in your workflow, right? It's it's not going to be a feature, uh, and and yeah, of course we'd all like to work on features twenty four seven, but that's not the reality of what we do, right? And even talking about maintenance, I mean, you're going to split up maintenance between technical maintenance and uh, team team maintenance has, I guess, organizational maintenance, let's call it. So like, you know, we, we use these to discuss what's going on in our day to day, right? We use these, these podcasts and, and we're level setting stuff as we go along too. It's not like we're coming here presenting stuff to do. This isn't a webinar, right? This is us having a discussion about what we think and, and kind of hashing out the differences between us and, and trying to see where we both stand on any given issue. And, and we just bring up different issues and, and stuff that we're currently working on and, and, and hash through that. Right. So it's not, it's not us coming in and preaching. It's us it's coming in and you're Talking. hearing our live discussions on how we're figuring out stuff in real time Talking or it, in right. two and a half speed, depending on how you listen to your podcasts. <laughs> and that along with team meetings, along with touch bases or standups, right, are always going to have a role in in organizations, right? Because as an organization, you have to you have to level set. You also have a, a social aspect there where you're going to have to um, just kind of bounce each other's presence off each other. Just the, hey, you know, I'm human. I'm here. I'm, I'm making mistakes, right? You're human. You're there. You're making mistakes, right? Let's talk about, you know, the good stuff, the bad stuff. Let's, let's humanize ourselves. We are a team. We need to work as a team and to have it, to work as a team, we're going to have to have trust and to build trust. We need to have these relationships. So this is relationship building in addition to that. Now that can't be automated, but the rest right. of the maintenance, right? The rest of the you know, every time, yeah, every month, right? I'm doing migrations manually, right? I'm checking for backups manually. I'm I'm uh, updating services manually. I'm running migrations manually. Like that's something in the future that could be automated, but not something that is more important for me than 
either new services right or more important than than bug fixes like that's something that's i would put that in that's where i was i would kind of split the difference right there is i would say that's just a maintenance task i don't know if i would call that tech debt there's toil around it but i don't i don't know if i would call that tech debt because it's just a regular maintenance task that occurs there is toil around it but i don't think that's tech debt well i think we the the toil could still be reduced right so it's automation that has not yet been written right right so there, there could be an aspect of tech debt to it, but there's always going to be that task there, right? But that task can go from a five to a two, right? Depending on what kind of automation we put around it, right? right. And I see limiting that complexity yeah. that allows us that that I would call tech debt. If that reduces way... the tech debt, right? Right. Reducing that complexity from a five to a two. At the end of the day, it's still something we have to do every month. Now, yes, you might not have to spend as much time on it. Yeah, if if you can if you can reduce the tech debt, and that's you know a lot of the conversation around it is about reducing tech debt. It's not saying let's eliminate tech debt because that's never going to be the case, right. right? But going in there, rearchitecting it, and saying, all right, so we have it automated this way. Let me write some glue code, and then let me bridge that, and then get rid of the glue, glue code. You know, then then you have a nice bridge uh, on on top of that. So so that is that is tech debt that you can solve but it's not tech debt where all right now we no longer have to drive the truck from point a to point b it's just now we don't have to go down into the cavern and and up we can go across the nicely automated bridge i I like that i like that one right there i like that one right there (laughs) but we do have the article linked in the show notes uh they did mention i'll just plug it here they had another one out there for organizational debt which was kind of something interesting i'm not going to dive into it on this episode um but i would recommend checking it out um but with that do we want to jump into community updates well we're talking about tech debt um i mean you know the what 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 are the what are the numbers here i mean they have uh 61 let's call it an average of 50 percent, maybe maybe 45 percent of time spent on tech debt, we can call 10% in managerial duties, right? So let's say 45% of our time is actually working on new features, right? I'll tell you what, I have been super impressed with NextCloud's 45% because their 45% is way above and beyond a lot of other organizations' 45%. Totally. Every every time I look around the corner, they've got some kind of new release out there. So shout out to them. I think I've given them a shout out like the past three or four episodes now. At this point, every every episode they got something new coming out. They do, they do. They they're just plugging away. I love it. Yeah. Do you want to take this one, or do you want me to take it? I did go through that. Yeah. Uh, so okay. yeah. so I saw that Nextcloud Hub uh, twenty two was released. Uh, they actually announced it in a virtual presentation. Which I'm not sure I I, I I like that 100%, but not my decision. Uh, but they have a couple improvements coming with version 22. Uh, user-defined groups with circles. Uh, did you look into that at all? Did you, you did you get a grasp on that? Because I know we had... It's managing your contacts on a user basis is kind of how I understood it. Instead of having an admin that manages each group individually, kind of how we talked about it during the... Um, user management show rather mm-hmm. than admins. Uh, basically, the user is able to create their own groups through this and manage their own, what do you want to call it, file sharing tasks and contacts. Uh, yeah, it's it's like shorthand. So say you're in a NextCloud instance with your entire family, your extended family, you know, your grandparents, your nieces, nephews, aunts, uncles, cousins, all that. And you say, well, I want just a group that is just my immediate family. You know, right. me, my sister, my mom, my stepdad, right? So what I say is I'm going to create a circle just for my own usage. It's it's almost like my own shorthand. And I say, hey, send it to my you know immediate family. So right. I share this with my immediate family. And then I don't have to rely on a, a group administer a group administrator to to create that or administer that or, or whatnot. I can just have it as a shorthand for everything that I'm doing. I can just say, hey, 
send it everything. To... Yeah. Um, Everything that is circle enabled, right, is able to, to recognize that that shorthand and Nextcloud's official applications are, are integrating that as well. So I thought that was pretty cool. I'm not sure what the administration uh, capabilities of that are. Like, I, I don't think you're able to add new users with circles like group administrators are able right. to add new users within that group. So. There doesn't seem to be that level of power there. It's just a shorthand for you to describe a, a group of people. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, just coming at it from the other perspective saying, hey, I need a way to define this stuff. And the next guy's like, yep, we got you. Got it. So yeah, very cool. Um, they're integrating chat and deck, it seems. So they are, their, their heavy focus was, and focus meaning like they use it in, seven different examples right they're like you can create a task based off of a chat message and i was like oh really tell me that again you've already heard my take on chat but uh okay cool now you can now you can actually call back and say hey this is what you actually said and i captured it in a task i guess i don't know yeah um but even before the show i mean that's that's the way we work, though, to be fair. I mean, we we were having a discussion. I said, ah, this is messed up. Jack, can you create a task for me? He went Got into the camera yeah. and, and, and did it, right? Now, that is a little bit more easier to say than let me capture the voice command and automate it to send it to Nextcloud and automatically create a deck instance for me. It's just like, just, just go type in a couple words and copy paste some stuff, right? <laughs> Easy enough. I mean, that's that's why we still have humans, because we're not omnipotent computer users yet. Uh, so so we're, we're, we're still getting there. And, you know, integrating chat with test, task management, that's great. I'm all for more integrations. Um, I just think this is more of a nifty kind of thing. Like, all right, if you use both of them. Once again, DEC is a more Trello-like system anyways. I wouldn't exactly call it project management. I would call it a task list more than anything. An organized task list. Yeah, or or even I mean I've seen people use it not for tasks but just like organizational hierarchies like having everything having it a replacement for a knowledge base even Deck? and and yeah and and How using columns okay. as like a a singular um a singular concept for for instance uh, how I'm working with the the church right so we have the kind of building slash grounds maintenance thing and that's all combined into one and outreach is a, a its own thing but it's it's all of these stacks and all these stacks contain like you know who's in charge of it, it the attached documents to-do lists and you know and and they're just broken up by by organizations but it feels like more of a a knowledge management than a actual task moving stuff across different phases of a project board so you can use deck like that. You can use it like a project management tool, but I'm telling you, if, the, if you're using it like a project management tool, there are better tools out there to do that. So you can, you can certainly integrate chat and test management and maybe that's a benefit for you. I don't know. Uh, speaking of knowledge management though, I was going to say that was the big one right there. That absolutely was the big one. Yeah, so there there were a couple others, but I'm gonna I'm gonna focus in on this one for the duration here. So next slide twenty two uh, introduces basically a wiki. Like you know, there's there's no two ways about it. It's it's basically a wiki. Now something I was thinking about. So there is there there's been a couple. Do you listen to Cortex? No, the podcast. Okay, so the, Cortex is the podcast by CGP Gray. Uh, the guy who did that meme video, and he does a whole lot of other animated uh, video styles that are yeah. super helpful for explaining complex problems uh, or, or, or topics. And he has a podcast with one of his coworkers or, or his other friend. Yeah. I, I don't know, right? But he has he has a podcast with this guy, and they go back and forth and talk about just productivity things right and the, and they're big apple guys so they're they talk about like uh, the wc w3c whatever that that co apple conference is and they, they talk about apple products a lot um and then they also talk about like productivity hacks and and life hacks and stuff like that um 
in in a very down to earth like I tried this out for a month and it was terrible kind of way. You know, it's 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 really fun listening listening to that. He's actually the guy who did Spaceship U, the whole productivity video that we went over in the very first episode. That was him. Yeah. So that was that was him and and his podcast goes over a lot of that productivity stuff and recently uh he's gotten big into different note-taking applications uh so he had been taking notes in like evernote for a long time he had taken notes in notion something else and he's finally settled on obsidian uh, which was a Mac only application. I think it has an app image for Linux now, and I'm tempted to, to try it out. It basically simply looks like a wiki with dynamic linking and a mind map functionality at the nice. end of it. Yeah. Right. What I'm seeing in Nextcloud's knowledge base mimics that. Something a similar lot. to that. Yeah. In that it has a lot of inner page linking and you can do that it's not necessarily dynamic uh, you do have to specify it specifically whereas something like obsidian would auto you can search auto and it link would show it you all of the yeah yeah all the d- the different um associations but this is this is like uh, you know a confluence or a media wiki or or just a a very simple version of of either of those where you're just writing documentation down and uh, editing it it has a couple nice features like showing who edited what line so you can you can actually go line by line and 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 word by word and see all right who edited this when yada yada uh and version control and linking to documents or events or tasks or stuff like that so once again it just brings in the rest of the next cloud ecosystem and says we're all going to work as one kind of like in a g suite type of way like i said they continue to move that direction and it i mean it looks fairly basic and good at the same time so i've i'm impressed um i i I honestly figured that there would be something like this already there but uh i'm glad to see it's it's kind of coming out yeah and you know what i think we would talked about it before with nextcloud specifically about a knowledge base and before really it kind of it wasn't great it ended up being you know put in documents in here Rather than having it just lay out on the page right in front of you, it was, uh, all right, well, let's use like a plugin or some kind of, you know, third party app to open up a document. And you can edit the document in there, but this is just like kind of that simple collaboration that's directly in front of you. Nothing, nothing really special needed. And that, I, I think for that, it's nice. It's, it's right there, right in front of you. I'll tell you what, though, I always have a, very difficult time i've I've always wanted to try mind mapping because i'm like how does this actually work yeah um and and even just taking notes right because i know that i just want to word vomit onto the page and have it be intelligently sorted for me sure whatever that means like i i don't even have a good definition of intelligently sorted for me um one of the one of the things I've been thinking about is is mind mapping, right? And and have drawing those connections between different thoughts and stuff, and and trying to figure that out. I, I just don't have a good good way of of jotting that down, um, or really even taking notes. I, I did see this very interesting way of taking notes when I was interviewed for my company's uh, gym newsletter or whatever i mean back, yeah back in like 2019 or whatever uh the the people running the gym uh the gym attendants used to uh have something in the company newsletter every month and it had like a highlight or whatever and i had you know gone there for several months i think it was probably like nine months at that time just constantly and they're like hey can we you know get your story or whatever i'm like oh yeah absolutely so i sat down uh, with one of the attendants, uh, Sarah was her name, and went over kind of like, you know, my story and yada, yada, yada. But what was very interesting is while she was taking notes, she took it in an in indentation style that I hadn't necessarily seen before. So she would she would write kind of like one one note per line and, and kind of trail off. And, sure. And, but when, when there was a different idea breaker, when, we, when I jumped to a 
a new subject or a new topic, right, or, or, or just made a leap in logic to a different section, uh, she would indent. And then she'd keep on taking notes. And then every time I do that, she would just keep indenting and indenting until she got about halfway into the paper. And then she drew a little arrow back to the, the far left side and then started from the left side again and then just kept indenting. Okay. And then every time there was a logical break, you know, in either the conversation, like she asked a question um, or I jumped to another tangent, you know, a tangential yeah. topic. Yeah. She indented. And recently I've been interviewing my coworkers uh, for, for a, a podcast type thing. Yeah. Just because I know how to do that. Um, people aren't getting the time to kind of chill out and, and talk to other people right now. So I'm like, this is this is a good way to kind of sit down and have an informal conversation formally. So I was like, right. let me let me try that and, and started taking notes like that. And I'm like, this is very, very helpful. I was able to not only have a good organization and flow to my notes, right? But even like live in the interview, it was easy for me to remember what topic I wanted to reference and where I had written it down. It was just mapping that out mentally. It was it was easy to, to go back there and say, oh, that was like three paragraphs ago. And, uh, and I'm adding like different rules for myself. Like every time I speak, I have a line break or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just, I found it fascinating. I'm like, this is a very different system than anything I had ever come across before. Just keeping track of a logical flow in conversation. Great. What were you using before then? Just, Oh, I, I am terrible at taking notes, dude. I am the worst at taking notes. Yeah. Um, I was using a, basically what Markdown facilitates. So like yeah. headers and first and second bullet points. Yeah. Um, first, second, third bullet points, maybe. But I was just like, you know, I, I'd, I'd never seen anything like that before. And it was it was a way to very naturally capture the way a flow in a conversation worked, you know. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I had no clue about that before. And that was just something that struck me out of the blue. What can I do about, you know, note taking or knowledge based retention where that kind of thing works, where it is a flow that mimics the way I conceptualize things, uh, it, whether it's a knowledge base or whether it's just note taking or whether it's procedure documentation or, or what have you. Right. So I'm always looking for that, that new thing. So yeah, if, if there are any types of systems out there that people are like, Oh, they're, you're screaming at your, yeah. your phone right now saying, Oh, you have to check this thing out. Please let, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Let, let us know. Go to arcompose.com. Uh, send us send us feedback you know give us give us that feedback it's always good to hear feedback too like even even if you don't have a suggestion if even if you just want to reach out and say hey you know like what you guys are doing or hey i hope you know in the future you get to to cover this thing i'd be more than happy to to field that but uh let us know i'm always looking for new new cool new cool things i am too that's what i got to say about that and speaking of new cool things there have been some new cool things that we've been developing at Arcompose recently. So, Jack, if you want to take over. Yeah, so third episode in a row is what I'll say here uh, for this concierge sign-up. I know we've mentioned it quite a few times, but finally it's out there. Uh, actually, we did, like, a, I would call it a little pair programming this past Monday. Walk through all the code, walk through the code base on it. Um, there are some a few things that we can swim down that we'll take a look at for making it just a faster what i'd call checkout or process but uh overall it's out there and we are ready if you guys want to sign up we have it down pat and ready to go for you and then with that also we have our upcoming third quarter plan third quarter planning meeting uh this upcoming weekend so uh andrew and i are gonna get together friday here for, uh this upcoming weekend and just go over what we'd like to see over the next quarter and then kind of where our I guess pitfalls were uh, for this past quarter and what we need to improve on. So I recently picked up, yeah, I recently picked up Scrum, the book. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm I'm going through that. I might do that as a grab bag topic next episode, just cause. And I was, I was impressed with how much we've implemented as far yeah. as process goes. Yeah, and and how well 
we're doing that. The one thing I might want to address is different kind of metrics, but those are always difficult when it comes to, to Scrum and, and, and tracking progress. And, and I, I do believe we're doing good evaluations, uh, and I think we need to continue uh, to evolve our retro and, and review, retrospectives and, and, and reviews and say, all right, how did, how did we actually do, right? Right. Did we get everything accomplished? You know, are we setting our boards up so it should be clear after two weeks or are we over estimating the work that we can complete? You know, what, what are our averages? You know, how are we doing? So um, maybe something to evolve Q3 just internally to say how we're doing. Uh, otherwise, you know, I, I, I think we have a solid foundation of, of what we're, we're implementing currently. Right. With that, talking about next episodes in scrum i i think we should dive into this i think we should dive into this episode right here and a little bit of vault warden all right yeah yeah i yeah our our provocatively titled episode living as an inmate yeah you want to explain that (laughs) sure sure i i I think i think i owe us an explanation and actually this is even a little bit out of context because initially when i was setting up this episode going over our documentation uh for vault warden it fell under the 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 two topics i'm going to cover now fell under the everyday usage category and i was like well every day you're living life with it and and you're living it with a a warden and i'm still not sure if i want to call it bit warden or vault warden depending uh that's something tbd but it's going to be a warden nonetheless. And you know who has wardens every day. So I'm figuring we're either way, either, either way, uh, Jack and I have agreed to live as inmates in the vault, vault warden or bit warden. I'm going to call it vault warden <laughs> ecosystem. I did want to go over several things uh, about it though. And this is, Mainly front end stuff, so this isn't going to change depending on which verbiage we we end up using. Um, if you're coming to us from the future, and you say, "What is this vault warden thing you're talking about?" Just we're talking about bit warden, and and if you're like, "What is this bit warden thing you're talking about?" We're talking about vault board. So, um, if you're not already thoroughly confused, let's go ahead and dive into the rest of this. So I have. Two, two pages here uh, to go over, and the pages are about the application interface. Today, we're going to take a look at the desktop and the mobile space when it comes to Bitboard. Uh, we're mainly going to be discussing how we access this Bolt Warden and how we display Bolt Warden to users. Right, and the first thing I'm going to go over is the desktop. So. Most of us are comfortable with desktop applications, uh, sure. even though I'd, I'd say I probably use uh, mobile applications, probably not as much, but there are some that I, I use only on, on uh, mobile. But there sure. are, there's definitely always going to be a soft spot, spot in my heart for desktop applications, and I, I just think it's going to be uh, easier for, the, uh, until really augmented reality comes becomes a thing and then it's just going to be some kind of like virtualized desktop right so right. there's always going to be some kind of large scale interface right but it's it's notably different currently on desktop than it is on the mobile space so i wanted to, to address them separately uh, first the the desktop here has several different ways to access bitwarden uh, and i'll just go over those here so the first way is through the web app uh, I have written here, in its most basic form, there is a web app that users can log into with their browser. And it's exactly how you would look, expect it to look. You know, you have an email address and you have a master password prompt, right? So you put in what amounts essentially to your username and password and you log into it like sure. you would log into any other web service. Right? Sure. Plain, for, you know, straightforward, simple. Uh, and as a as a practical way to implement this, I mean, this is most handy as a bookmark in a web browser uh, or for accessing on public or otherwise non-typical devices. So if I have yeah. to borrow someone's computer or if I want to access it in, in a public computer or whatever where I, I'm not using it 
on my cell phone or I don't have my own personal laptop on it, but I need yeah. to get to my passwords, right? This is 99% of the the way that I would access it away from those devices. I, I, I was going to say, I'd put myself in that same boat there. I all I know there's the plug-in, which you're going to go over the add-on, um, but honestly, it I don't know why I do this. I always end up going to my own site to pull passwords down. I don't know what it is. I don't know what I, maybe I've just changed my train my brain to you do that do it that way. Um but I I have a Bitwarden tab open on my browser almost all the time oddly enough and I just have to I just jump back. I just end up jumping back to it. Fair enough. And and like I mean we were talking about last episode, you know, searching for those entries is fairly trivial so it's it's yeah. not difficult i although i do think you lose a couple things and and we're going to go over that here when i talk about the add-on uh in in desktop but it's a it's a perfectly viable way to to work um i have here as a note that uh, i think this is the best place to perform administrative functions such as yeah. manipulating folders and organizing groups i think those are best done through the web app or the, the desktop application because it's a similar layout. But the, the web app yeah. is going to give you exactly what you need. And it's it's w- way more spelled out for you in one page. Whereas if you go through the add-on or the mobile or whatever, it's going to be a lot more compact. And therefore, stuff is going to be hid behind different menus. And this kind of lays everything out in front of your face. So um, I think if you need to do a whole lot of creating new folders or different organizational stuff. I think it's, it's easiest to go through the web application. Um, now I did want to make a note here and, and this may be relevant to you since you love to have this open, you pre- kind of prefer this. Yeah. Uh, we're always talking about defense in depth, right? So it's, it's good to keep in mind, you know, what, what is my threat vector here? Right? So I say that, while a compromised server cannot access your encrypted information, right? What's stored on disk is a blob, uh, for lack of better terminology. Uh, it is able to modify the web app code that it serves to your browser. Uh, the concern would be potentially injecting malicious code, right? So if something does get on your server, it doesn't matter because they can't decrypt anything. Like we said, everything's on client side, but what they can change say they have full permissions and they could they just have the run of the land the the first thing that they would be looking at doing is uh injecting malicious code into the web app that's being served to your browser sure uh so that's why personally i would say it's recommended to use platform native implementations such as the browser add-on or desktop or mobile client because those clients aren't served by the self same server that's holding your data. Yeah. Whereas the web server is serving you that front end brand new every single time talking about defense in depth. That's just one thing to, that's a great point to bring up. Therefore let's talk about the browser add on. And I, I, I will say I linked to Bitwarden's documentation on almost every header in this documentation because they're, their docs are fabulous, right? That, I mean, just just really, really good. So I wanted to to do that before I, you know, kind of wrote down anything myself, uh, and and have more of a, a personal take when when talking about this stuff for for us. So I say this is where the application really shines. Talking about the browser add-on here, it brings together all the aspects that you would want in a password manager, including autofill, new login creation, and of course, random password genera- generation. Uh, the add-on button, I have a little screenshot of, uh, in case you were unaware of what it looked like, uh, and talking about how it will indicate with a pop-up number whether it has an autofill match for the site in the current tab. So the number one use case here is autofill. And sure. this is just super straightforward and easy. I mean, it'll pop up, hey, I think I have a password for this. And you click it, and it fills in your username and password for you. Now, there's also an option to have it auto-fill and auto-login at the same time. But I, I don't have that turned on. I just say, just let me know if there's an option to, to log in. 
Uh, now, clicking on that button will actually bring up a minimized version of the web app, uh, which looks very similar to the mobile app. I think it's actually the same kind of code base. Um, and allows you to perform almost all functions that you would need to consume the service. Um, like I said before, though, the web app is still the best place to access the more advanced functionality. So the autofill on the add-on, uh, hop in right over to that because that is the killer feature here, is, is straightforward. For every login, there's a field named URI that accepts one or more entries. This allows the browser to determine which logins are for which site. Once that has been populated, the entry will show up in the tab section of the pop-up, right? So what's most important in order for Nextcloud to figure out what site it's on and what is an appropriate password for that site is for you to have already specified, hey, for this site, I want you to give me this password. Now, if you're retrofitting or importing uh, another another password management tool and, and importing it into Bitwarden, say, KeyPass, right, you might not have that field filled out, uh, in which case you can still pull down that uh, add-on uh, pop-up window, and you can search your vault just like you would search it anyways, um, and then also at that point, it, when you auto or when you log in and you don't have it saved in Bitwarden, Bitwarden will say, hey, it'll it'll drop down a little banner across the top of your web page and say, hey, do you want me to save this password for you? Right. And at that point, then you can say yes and you can have it saved in Bitwarden via that add on. Now, that doesn't help me when I'm logging into these ephemeral instances that you and I create for testing purposes, like right. getting that pop-up over and over and over yeah. again. But for like when I'm logging into a brand new site or using one that I didn't have the URI for before, it says, hey, you know, do you want to do you want to make sure you don't have to go through the hassle of searching for it again? I'm like, well, it's not much hassle, but still, it's still worth it to, right. to add it on there. Auto, auto fill it for me. Yeah. So I do have a screenshot of what that looks like uh, with all of my usernames blurred out, of course. But the, the page is our Nextcloud login for our compositional enterprise instance. Um, and you can see uh, that I'm able to select through a variety of logins, right? Because I have several different logins for the same URL. Um, now you can tweak the matching rules. You can say, hey, I want all the base URL or I want only this specific thing that's right. in the URI field to match. Um, and and it, it gives you a way to say, you know, if I only want city.com slash login to present that to me, I can do that. Or I can just have anything in my uh, Bitwarden that matches city.com to pop up as well. Uh, now, note that this does not work for cards. Uh, the cards functionality, functionality does not have a URI feature. Uh, interestingly enough, by default, and we'll go over this in the settings episode, but by default, it the pop-up will actually show you cards underneath all the login on your tab, right? So it'll just list all of your cards and just say whatever you want. Uh, I have that disabled here because you can only you can see this is only the logins for the services that we have running on the, our R Compose instance. So any questions so far? Because I, I, I know that you said you don't run with the the add-on, and for me this is like I do the have the add-on. I it. have it there. Oh, okay. Um, I'll tell you what though. I don't know what happened. So right now it's showing nine plus on Bookstack right now. I think it's because of the uh, you mentioned it. The eph- what would you, you say? The ephemeral uh, all everything related to the compositional enterprises instances, and it just saves. And I think I have about twenty here. I'm scrolling through them. 13, there it is, right at the top there. As well, you know, there, you can set it so it matches rcompose.com, which is all of our instances out right. there. Right. Or you can have it so that only the compositional enterprises.rcompose.com entries match. Right. right. So there are plenty of different ways to tweak, tweak that, that using those yeah. matching rules. I'm going to have to go through and update that because it is. It's actually for our subdomain, and I have a, or for our, you know, main, not top level, but our domain, uh, and then I think there's like, you know, a handful out there that are similar, where it's, you know, a galore of uh, instances. So I got two more to go over here for desktop. Uh, the 
the third obviously is the desktop client, the native client. Uh, there are native client for all major operating systems. Um, I guess the one thing that's that's cool here is that it's probably going to be the easiest for you to work with offline. Now, to be fair, your browser add-on, if you have that, is also going to be cached offline. So either way is going to work for you if you're not connected to the internet because your your passwords are cached. Obviously, they're not syncing, but they're cached. So you can you can always use them offline, um, except for the web app, which is obviously a web app and doesn't work offline. Right. Go figure. Uh, the the other cool thing that I saw about uh, desktop clients, if you have uh, biometric locks, um, you can or, or biometrics on your yeah. computer, like a fingerprint yeah. uh, reader or something like that, you can use those uh, as an alternative for re-entering your password to unlock it. So I know in my on my Mac for work, uh, I use my password to unlock my computer all the time. It's just super efficient. So being able to unlock Bitwarden with that same thing is also going to be nice. Say that again. Say, sorry about that. Say that again. So you use your, do you use a biometric for your, uh, to log into your Mac or do you use password? I use just biometrics. To, I okay, use my fingerprint. Okay. 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 I just want to come make sure. Yeah. I, Cause I think you yep. said password there, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Sweet. Yeah, yeah. So I, I use, I use my fingerprint to log into my Mac and, it would be nice to log into my password manager using the same same way, right? On desktop, the same yeah. Same kind of security that yeah. I would need, yeah. Um, now, if you're not comfortable with that, then fine. Use the master password. Sure. Um, I also believe you can use a combination of the two if need be. I like it. Um, there's also ways to do two factor, right? I I don't dive into that because I'm not even sure if we're able to provide that, but you, that is something that you That's can out take there. a look into. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and if it's something you're interested in, yeah, we can, we can look into that as well. Uh, but the last interface here is the command line client, which was most interesting to me. And specifically because this is, was the basis of the code I pulled in order to interact with the, the API. So there is an official CLI client, which is the, Bitwarden's official CLI that's yeah. linked there. And that has plenty of different functions and you know can do this and that and the other thing and yada yada. But what it can't do is it can't initialize an administrative user on the server. What do you mean? Oh, okay, I got you. So if you spin up a blank instance, it's not going to be able to create a user with an email and a password, basically. Exactly. I yeah. gotcha. For whatever reason or whatever requirement I had, it, it, it didn't meet that, right? So um, it's great for day-to-day -day kind of thing, but it didn't work for my use case. And and obviously, that's what you're going to probably want to use if you're going to script anything. Uh, but the alternative implementation that I found on GitHub was the one that right now is quote-unquote unmaintained or do they say unmaintained or like undeveloped because these – I saw that, like the last update to it was like three months ago or something like that. Um, but the, the the update for 2020, I, I love it here. He's like, it seems people still care about this code, oddly enough. <laughs> when I wrote this, the official CLI client didn't exist. I'm curious why people are using or wanting to use this over the Bitwarden official CLI since it exists now. I don't currently use the code anymore, but it's still maintained-ish, I guess. I still accept PRs anyways, but I don't actively work on this code anymore. So I'm like, all right, that's cool, <laughs> you know? And uh, it it works uh, for when I tried it out, I was able to, to get the demo up and running with an instance that I had set up and I used the underlying primitives in order to set up the token generation that I needed uh, to interact with the Bitborn API yeah. upstream. Uh, so that was that was really fun to do. Obviously, it's I, I love tinkering that way. But uh, I was I, I used that as the basis. So if anyone needs to dive into what's actually exposed, that is a great resource. Just reading through that code, um, if you have the need to, that should get you everything that's necessary. And you can you can see in code in very plain and simple Python code, really what those primitives actually are, like how you're generating these hashes and how you're generating these, you know, 
uh, encrypted blobs and stuff like that. So it's it's pretty cool. I was I was excited to to dive into that. And that's how you said you got down in the nitty gritty of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then I, I do link to my own script there as well, too, if you want to see some very, very hacky uh, Python there. And this is to, uh, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong here, this is to generate the user, though, right? This generates different uh, parameters we need. So it, it generates the master, pa- master password hash and the protected key in order to pass those to the server. So using those two things, we can manipulate the API to create that login for that, us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, that and I think the email as well, um, and the uh, key, key, the the KDF iterations, which is um, the amount of times it runs through the the algorithm. You can see all these print statements. Just. It, you just just yeah just littering this code just comment it out and you know it was actually pretty fun to to print those out by one by one and say okay this gets turned into that gets turned into the other thing and you know it gets stretched and padded out and you know the the mac key and you generate the symmetric key and just just going through all these these yeah. crypto primitives that i've forgotten about you know for for several years kind of all coming back and then, then grabbing that and iterating over it, you know, as as many times. And and I think actually in the, so it was, it was odd. In the Bitwarden CLI, that is maintained ish. Yeah. They only iterate like ten thousand times, and this iterates a hundred thousand times. And what ended up happening is. They're consistent internally. Like I said, Bitwarden just kind of holds the blob on the back end and provides a, a pretty yeah. little API in order to access it. Well, what happened is the web vault iterated over it 100,000 times. Right? And the Bitwarden CLI that was maintained-ish only iterated it over 10,000 10, times. Yeah. So it was internally inconsistent when I created it with the CLI and went to log in with the web vault. Because the web vault client says I'm going to iterate this a hundred thousand times yeah. in order to get the 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 hash of, of whatever I need to, to log in, and the the CLI says every time I log in I'm only iterating fifteen thousand times yeah. or, or yeah. ten thousand times or whatever, so I could never get it to log in with the web vault because the web vault was doing it differently. So I had to dig down into that as well to figure out okay what params this is passing. Oh these are different. Oh I need to fix it. So that was that was a, a mind bender in itself. Oh, I'm sure. I can imagine like your you know the parameters for the server and the basically client are mismatched causing that problem. Now, if Bitwarden never goes back and says, "Hey, we're upgrading these to all log in with different, you know, number of iterations," then it will break the existing functionality right. on, on instances. Um because the, the clients, you know, that's not the web vault that's served with the server unless you pin the clients at a specific version. Those clients are still going to be iterating at a different uh, I- I- integer right. than right. than the the other client created. So it's it's interesting. Once again, the server really doesn't have any say in the process. It just kind of sits there and says, I found it or I didn't find it. You know, just to, it's a very interesting implementation and I'm, I'm really happy with it. I'm really happy with it. Um, so after having really got my hands dirty there, um, I was really happy to see that mobile just works, right? Sure. And there's a lot of really good stuff with mobile that I like here. You know, um, it, it is pretty much the same, I'd say, as a browser add-on. It's meant to be used uh, as a as a client. You know, it, it's yeah. not necessarily best for performing administrative functions. Sure, right. right. Um, one of the things I found out is that for your own protections, the mobile apps don't let you take screenshots. <laughs> so, really, yeah. How about that? Okay, okay. On Android, at least, it blocked the screenshotting functionality. Yeah, so you don't do something stupid. Like take a screenshot of your password or, you know, in this case, 
you know, a, a instructional video on how to walk through it. Now I'm glad I got the camera now because now I, I can't record my phone yeah. <laughs> walking through a login because it's going to be blocked. So that was, that was an interesting thing to, to figure out. Um, uh, and, and actually I wanted to take a picture for the unlock options and I'll get there in a second, but something notable that, you know, besides the installs, for Apple and Android, like you would be used to it on the App Store and the Google Play Store, respectively. For Android, the application is also available in the F Droid repos. Nice. So, since yeah. Bitwarden is and will continue to be open source, which is the reason why I was able to hack around the code in the first place, it is actually able to be put into the F Droid repos. Now, it there's additional functionality that's required there, but. Uh, there is a way to to get it into F Droid. Um, now, this is an interesting component of F Droid. I don't think we've ever talked about it, but F Droid is a client, much like we're talking about right now with a with a Bitwarden client that can access multiple servers. So Bitwarden can, or F Droid, excuse me, can actually go out to different repositories and grab packages from different repositories. For instance. I have one of my repositories pointed to the mobile Kali Linux yeah. repository. So I get a whole lot of hacking and cracking tools from there. Not that I use them, but I, they're I'm there available. if I need them. Yeah. Matrix maintains their development builds on their separate re repos of Element. And I think one of their other mobile clients as well. As well uh, similarly, Bitwarden has a mobile app repository for their Bitwarden client uh, on, on Android mobile. So um, I'm able to add that repository to my F Droid client on my cell phone and say, Hey, I'm going to point to this repo. Please grab the Bitwarden package from this repo. And they do that for several reasons. But one of the things is if you want to get onto the official F Droid repos, F Droid itself has to be able to compile your code and it has sure. to be able to compile it in a certain way. And I'm not sure if they just like didn't want to do that and just said, well, we'll just maintain our own repo then and just make it available to anyone who wants to add our repo. And F Droid is like, yeah, sure, whatever. You can point to your own repo and that's, that's fine. But to get onto their built in out of the box repo, I, I think they have to build your package itself for, so. yeah. Yeah. I thought that was interesting, at least. But the, you know, it's it's awesome. I love open source software, and I love seeing it being used like this, exactly the way it was supposed to be in a federated type manner. Now, talking about unlock options, though, uh, when you dive into actually using the application itself, for the initial login, uh, your master password is of course required, as it generates the data necessary to retrieve your passwords. Right? Sure. However, after the initial login, you have the option of unlocking the application simply with your biometrics or your phone's PIN. Uh, so if you're on Apple, I would assume that it works with a facial login recognition, right? So for me, it takes a uh, full password every time. Uh, I, th I don't Do know you if not you have it set up. I that might that could be part of it. I have not looked into it uh, to tell you the truth. Usually I do not. I I'm not a frequent flyer of Bitwarden on mobile. Uh, I don't really it's, find myself using it all that often. And if I do, it's just end up putting in the master password and using well, it that and, way. And yeah, that's, that's easy enough. I might have you do the settings episode so we can, we can have you dive into some of these things. See it. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I, I say it's recommended to set it to one of the above since it would get extremely tedious to continuously be required to insert your master password every time that you want to autofill a login, right? Sure. So once again, up to you, it's it's the same argument as the desktop client, right? If you feel that you are sufficient, you know, sufficiently protected, um, go ahead and, and make it a biometric because it's, it's going to be a lot easier. Um, at least that's my take on it. Now, I use it for the autofill, and I have uh, just a screenshot here of me logging into mobile eBay. Uh, and it prompts me for my password and, uh, the autofill will pop up, uh, if you enable it in the settings. So once again, something else to look forward to, 
uh, the following prompt pops up whenever you click on a password field. This is an example like I have here of logging into eBay on a mobile browser. So yeah. after clicking on the password field, it just literally pops up autofill with Bitwarden. Yeah. You know? And yeah. clicking on that will actually take me to the application um, where I can select the uh, password, password to autofill yeah. it will. Yep. Um, keep in mind that the autofill follows all the rules of the browser add-on, right? So if it's not there by URI, gotcha. Um, also, Android at least, and I'm sure Apple is the same way, it has an internal identifier for different applications. So like I've noticed, like I can open up a an application, right? And if I've logged out of it and I go to log into it, it will say, you know com dot application yeah. dot name right um is is not found in your your vault i'm like well yeah because that's for this other service right. that is obviously not you know um that's not the uri but it it can also store its internal uri if you need to now as you know i mean w- when you're on your phone you're not usually logging out and logging into applications. Usually it, you log in and you just leave it. Saves it, leave yeah, it sure. In. Yeah. So at that point, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you're doing stuff like I, I access a, a lot of things through my mobile browser, right? And I clear out the, the cookies out of there like I would on my desktop browser, right? So that doesn't sort of log in history, so... Every time I go back, I have to re-log in, and Bitwarden handles that for me. All right. uh, but just just knowing that I don't have to open it on my desktop and manually type it into my phone is pretty reassuring. Well, they have the clipboard, too. I know that's kind of what's available on mobile for iOS that I've kind of used, which is just standard across the board. Two-factor works that way, that same way. Um, so yeah, there's, there's plenty of different ways. I also linked the documentation of mobile up here. You know, they go through all that more, um, to the, the bitwarden.com. I had something real quick here. I actually went through this past week. I think it was after, I think it was Monday after we last talked. Um, and I had went through and I had updated all my one-time passwords for, to use Bitwarden instead of a phone. Yeah. 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 So I'm excited about that. I was really happy to get a lot of those moved, and it, it was a total pain. Um, but oh yeah, yeah. For the most part, they are now off my phone, which was what I would describe as a single point of failure there. <laughs> Absolutely. So now I have. Absolutely. You know, I am pretty good about my backups for um, Bitwarden and everything. And I know if we have, you know, if you sign up for an instance at our Compose. We have we do backups and all that as well, so you know you don't have that single point of failure with the phone. Yeah, in this way, there's no excuse not to do two factor, right. and right. along with a password manager and an ad block. I mean, two factor auth is going to yeah. be on the top five security recommendations. You know, I'd say probably keep keep your software updated. Um, use a password manager. Use two factor. You know what else? HTTPS. I don't know if that's a good one. That's kind of forced on you anymore. But don't give your password to anybody for any reason. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> people do <Yeah>. it. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's in my top five, but you know, <laughs> we have a top three, right? <laughs> Definitely a top three. No, but speaking of remembering things. I want to get into this week's grab bag topic, which is the active recall and space repetition. I call it, you know, keeping skills sharp and remembering things. I had an interesting discussion with a friend this past weekend about who's in med school about how he remembers everything for school because he said it just kind of compounds on everything kind of compounds. And I was thinking to myself, what what do I do for my own personal like how do i remember this like i i was talking to you monday we went up we had just finished how to win friends and influence people and it's you know a book you had mentioned you'd gone back on three or four times it's a book you go back on three or four times and you read it you know maybe once a year once a quarter and you think about it and it kind of is ingrained in your memory the more you think about it and talk about it but i wanted to go through kind of what he was talking about a little bit which was this active recall and space repetition um, and I'll just briefly go through the notes here. And then I did want to ask you how you kind of 
if you've used these kind of methods, I know we were talking about it earlier in the podcast, if you've used any of these methods before or how you kind of just keep skill sharp, how you remember kind of the fundamental points from, you know, books you've read or information just kind of gathered and picked up, uh, like if you have a review for it um, and anything like that, but just to kind of dive into it. Active recall is retrieving information from memory through testing yourself at every stage of the revision process. So to me, a lot of this method was built around exams per se in school, um, which I didn't, I think it can be taken and modified. Um, but basically the very act of retrieving information and data from our brains, not only strengthens our ability to retain information, but also improves the connections in our brains between different concepts. Uh, so the space repetition here is just kind of that taking that active recall, basically questioning yourself before, you know, just reading right over it or reading the material space repetition is basically involving spacing your revision, reviewing notes, looking at notes, testing yourself, quizzing yourself, uh, and reviewing topics, ideally by active recall at specific intervals over a period of time. Um, they did have this great graph. I didn't include it because it's a podcast, but essentially it can be explained by the uh, forgetting curve is what they described it as. Um, it's the idea that over time we forget things at an exponential rate, similar to this is, I love the example, similar to the half-life of a radioactive substance for, you know, more of a scientific analogy. Um, and basically what this curve was, uh, if you can picture a graph, a two-dimensional graph here, I'm going to do a terrible job of explaining this. Hopefully, hopefully I can get something in somebody's, anybody's mind here. Uh, it's a 2D graph. And then at the very top is, uh, you know, I've reviewed this material and it's like, okay, it's at a hundred percent. then over time, over time, if you don't review that material, it's basically going to exponentially go to zero and you're going to forget it. Uh, but if you review it at, you know, say you review 20 minutes on day one or you review, I won't even put a time there. You review day one. All right. So we'll just say if you don't review it any other time by day 20, you do, you have zero, you're at zero now. Um, now you can go day one. All right. You're at hundred. You go five days out. And maybe you're at 80, but if you review it again, you're back at 100. So it's kind of this keeping the thought in your brain um, and can almost like a continuous review, if you will, of man. I don't even know what I don't want to call it managing, but of study almost of you know keeping concepts sharp and ideas still floating around in your head. Um, but the way they kind of describe this forgetting curve, uh, that they can the site the way the cycle can be broken is by reviewing material at space interval intervals, which is kind of what I was talking about earlier. Um, the idea behind space repetition is that you allow your brain to forget some of the information to ensure that the active recall process is mentally taxing. So this has to be kind of hard. If 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 you know it inside and out, and you continue to review it, you know great but it's almost at that point i would describe a waste of time because you already know the material so fluidly um, the psychology literature literature suggests that the harder your brain has to work to retrieve the information the more likely it will be encoded i mean well you're just exercising you're exercising your brain as a, right. as a muscle at that point right right and i think that's what this whole thing is boiling down to the more the more i the more i see it every aspect of the human body is meant to be pushed yeah right? it's it's meant to be strain uh, strain it's I, I think it's what's used in lifting per se is you know you're supposed to strain it you know maybe 110 percent. you're not supposed to kill you're not supposed to kill everything in there but you're supposed to strain it a little bit and push it a little bit more every time yeah in ensuring that the active recall process is mentally taxing Right. So, so you are actively, you know, becoming frustrated or, or not, not right. being able to recall everything and then reminding yourself about that so that you can next time remember that because you, you learn from your mistakes. I mean, who doesn't learn from right. mistakes? You learn from your mistakes, but you know, if they don't, obviously it's a big, if it's a big enough mistake, you're going to 
make the note, but you can let the little ones compound as you forget them if they don't occur as frequently as, you know, if they're not on a daily basis, if, if it's something that happens, you know, once every six years and it's something minor, or I, I can't even think of an example, but you might run into that same mistake twice. So I'm um, just interesting, but uh, the process basically allows you to forget information and then forces you to actively use your brain to remember it and re-encode it. it it's exactly what you said. It's basically straining your brain. Yep. Uh, using it like a muscle. Um, so kind of the one prescriptive thing they had is uh, by spacing our repetition by a day, three days, then a week, we allow ourselves to forget some of the information such that when we revise or review the topic through active recall, it takes active brain power. That's that's the key one right there. You're not it's not passive. It's an active you're using you're using your brain. Uh, rereading, on the other hand, uh, has a low utility because it's just a passive exercise. Just testing yourself once has been shown to be more effective than rereading the same passage four times. So when he kind of described this to me this past week, I, honestly, my mind was blown because, I, you know, it's so easy anymore to just Google whatever, you know, oh, I need to do this method for this and, you know, I need to write this code to do this and it's just like all right well i'm running into this error it's so easy anymore to just search google than it is to actively look through and read api you know look at okay what what error are we running into and where is this in the uh what what does the actual you know upstream code say about what area you're running into rather than all right well what's the you know let me google this and see what the fix is so you know, it, it's more than just coding, I would say. It's also about just principles in general, like learning. Like we, I, I, I go back to it. We just read um, How to Win Friends and Influence People last week. And I could tell you, I, I remember a handful of examples. But if you ask me, you know, the four, the four different sections or, you know, what was in what each section described. I, I honestly, I read the book. I, I, and we talked about it. I could. I haven't been actively. It's it's kind of stale in my brain at this point. I would say you know, I have a few key concepts that I took away, but I I couldn't go through and list off. I think there were, you know, four sections, maybe nine or ten per section, uh, maybe not that many. But I, I can't. I couldn't go through and tell you all of that. So I didn't. I didn't know if you had anything. I wanted to ask you if you do any kind of like brain stressing or anything like that along those lines to remember anything or when you're learning new topics or for writing code in general or just related to learning even while you were talking though the one thing that sprung to my mind is uh how we handle uh at church going over the sermon right yeah. because we have the we have the sermon on sunday and then we get together in small groups yeah. on tuesdays uh, and and talk about it and that is you know that that talking about it discussing it coming at it trying to remember what the points were yeah uh, yeah integrating it now there's there's a lot more to this because as you said this is specifically for exams so i mean this is this lends itself this discussion lends itself more to to flashcards uh than it does actually integrating yeah. this into life this is right. more factual repetition um and, and 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 that that does work right and and especially if you're you're looking at it to to help you with an exam um there's there's a couple things i would i would put here uh the the act of actively taking notes um as you're going through learning sure. new process means that you are actively consuming that and interpreting it in real time as you're as you're learning new concepts so i think that's something that i always find helpful um so so taking notes when i'm reading something if i'm not just reading it to for pleasure. get a grasp or to learn so, yeah and i really don't read anything for just like pleasure pleasure but like you know if i'm not studying something I, i'd say you know i i watch tv for pleasure right, right. Uh, I, and then above that, I'd say I, I read for uh, learning, to learn, right? But yeah. then actually studying something and, and taking away, like like we did for how to win friends and influence people, you know, taking taking notes on that 
uh, as I'm live reading it, if you would, uh, is important. And then also, uh, you know, going back to the sermon, right? Uh, obviously, I'm taking notes during the sermon. Uh, and then I'm also discussing it. And so that's an, that's an integration, right? So that's something where I'm coming back to it and I'm putting my own spin on it and I'm reinterpreting it not just for myself but for others. Yeah. And I think that's what I wanted to cultivate here as well, right? Because we can ingest that information for like grab bag or right. for our developments or for our news or stuff like that. But us talking about it and bouncing these ideas off each other Right. And seeing what the other person got out of it versus you. I mean, even right after you read something, you don't retain it. Right. You, you retain a certain concept. You have right? to chew on it. You have to think about mm-hmm. it. Right. And and usually if I'm reading something, I've I've taken something away from it, quote unquote. Right. That's a right. That's a that's a turn of phrase. That's that's pretty regularly used. I mean, I, I took away, you know, um, don't criticize, can never complain. Yeah. From yeah. From how to win friends or influence people. Um, be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise. Right. These little quips that he has, you know, there's there's several that I took away. Uh, but that's through bouncing it off of you and saying, you know, what's important. And even just myself talking it through one, well, the, the, the last thing, not only just talking it through with someone else as a form of discovery of other important information, but also as a way to work through it yourself. I mean, when um, I, I, I listen to, to Jordan Peterson every now and then, and one of the things he's, he's said all the time on his lectures is, you know, I, I'm just kind of talking at the edges of my knowledge here. Right. He's sure. like, I'm I'm walking different paths around this this bit of information that I've kind of been playing with and and by explaining it to you I'm I'm revisiting it in a different way than I than I have been previously. Uh, so I, I always I always view our conversations in that way as well in, in that you know we're we're talking about Bitwarner, we're talking about ways to inf, uh, you know to influence people, right? Or yeah, how to win friends and influence people, and and just talking about that in a sense of I, I'm trying to think it through as well, and and glean from it the things that I believe would be important as I'm as I'm explaining it as I'm going through it. Right. Do you, so. How do you have a review process? So here, that's the active, right? That's the active. Uh, no, let me think here. That's the active recall. So space repetition would. What would you include? Do you have a process for space repetition? I know we had talked about cam board using tasks to go back and review, but I didn't know if you had anything that you would use to go, you know, to quite literally rev- go back through and say, okay, we did this. Do I need to chew on this again to go through it? Well, I think coming back to one of our earlier discussions, I think that's where something like a a very intelligent knowledge base would come in handy yeah you know okay yeah as as you type something up you you say oh you know i i i want to say it was something about this right and then then you you relate it to something right and then you reread what you had you had gone through before right and then you start relating it Uh, to what you're doing. And, and I do pull a lot of it into our conversations. Like I'm always referencing old stuff about what we've gone through, right. And, and looking stuff up again, but I wouldn't say that I have a, an active, like a active way to do space repetition. Well, and, and also I'm not studying for exams. Right. Right. Everything I ingest has to be actionable. Yeah. Right. Right. And that's where it's coming out. Yeah. It's coming out in, uh, oh, there's a really good quote about like it doesn't matter what I know if it doesn't change how I live or something like that. But I mean, even you said it was the fourth time going through how to win friends and influence people last time. So you must have some kind of like the book obviously has an impact on you if you've yeah. read it four times. Now, yeah. is it just kind of when you feel like picking it up or when you feel late, like when you feel like you've forgotten about it? Or how does that – is that just kind of like uh, arbitrary, like, oh, well, I'm going to pick it up today or something? How does that – like? I actually have found over the times I've read it, it's served a similar function to a lot of the podcasts that I listen to in that they all talk about the same thing, right? They're, they're all on, on a particular subject. Uh, but they always also serve to motivate me. Yeah. 
So, like, I know uh, Jason's podcast always motivates me to go out and try new things and yeah. and try to be a better communicator and, and, and really put a lot into uh, what I do. You know, uh, Jordan Peterson, you know, it reminds me, you know, how to how to live morally, you know, and, and, and think about stuff in a broader perspective. Right. And so I, I use these podcasts that I listen to to remind myself different things that I have already agreed that they're valuable for, right? These are, these are all reminders, you know, to broadcasting, you know, what, what's going on in the Linux ecosystem. Yeah. Sure. It's a news update, but it's always reminded me that there are other people out there going through the same problems, dealing with the same, you know, things and, and are, are on a similar journey. Right. And, and to get excited about Linux again, right. To get motivated about Linux again. And I use that book in the same type of way. I pick it up and I say, all right, I need to remember how important it is You're right. to be able to win friends and influence people and to care about people. Right. To be genuine right? with them. Right. Right. Yeah. As that book continues to, to, to harp on. And so I, I'd say I, I don't use it as far as like I need to remember these specific phrases. Right. Obviously. I remember the phrases because over the times I've read it, it that's what those are the phrases that motivate me that I okay. remember yeah. that I hold on to. I like it. I like it. Yeah, it makes the most sense. I, I don't think you have to add anything on. I think you leave it where it is. Yeah, I didn't know if you had any kind of pro. I didn't know if you had something structured. It doesn't sound like it. It sounds like uh, it's just kind of anything to get you going, anything to motivate you, anything to you know. Hey, I'm reading this, and Oh yeah, you know, I do need to be genuine with people and yeah, and and it's really easy to get you know unmotivated too. Sure, right, right. and you know, it, open source you know is is very important. It's it's becoming more and more important by the day, right? A, a lot of what we go over, right, is 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 groundbreaking. Look at what Nextcloud's doing. Yeah, right. They're Every they're time. challenging the big boys. Right. I mean, this is this is stuff that's going to, I mean, cliche, but change the world like there's it's it's already changed the world. COVID certainly changed the world. And, and next cloud, you know, as a reaction to that is is up in their game. Right. We, you know, collectively need to stay focused on where it's at and and where it's going. And these podcasts are are the way that that you and i do that that we that we try to bring this motivation we we, we try to bring this excitement we you know we we are super invested into this we we love this stuff and we love going over this now we can't do that without an audience right so in order to to grow and share the show right go to arcompose.com right at, at least subscribe to the mailing list and 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 share this episode right i mean i i'm sure there's someone who needs to know oh a password manager is important yeah oh yeah what's that right or or if someone is looking at next cloud if, if someone's on the outskirts looking to be brought in you know go ahead and 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 our compose.com will get you all the information that you need to follow us wherever we're going you know that allows us to get the show out and and get the show out to those who hear it because word of mouth right now is the best thing that we have going for us. But for now, we hope you enjoyed this episode of our ComposeCast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.